Thank you for having me today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for me to present at Revit User Group, seeing as that I, I launch Revit maybe once every quarter or so. Uh, but as Brian mentioned, I'm the civil uh, manager at ID8. I also do the instruction here in the Pacific Northwest, stationed out of our Seattle office. Uh, and part of my background has been working with LiDAR data and laser scan information for uh, quite a number of years back in, uh, I think it was 2008 or 2009. Uh, LiDAR was sort of picking up where data became more readily available. So at that point, I started looking into it. And slowly by slowly and year after year, technology has been improving and, and everything's getting faster, uh, getting much easier to manage. So we're at the point now where you can actually create models from digital photographs. So it's a digital photogrammetry process that is available through uh, Recap Photo. So Autodesk Recap Photo is the primary application that you'd be accessing to get from your pictures to a 3D object. And then from there, the idea behind the presentation was to see what we could get out of that. Um, so everybody, nowadays has a digital camera with access to their cell phones and things. So if, if you can start with that, you know, what, what can you get out of it? And that was the idea behind why I tried to work out this uh, workflow. And hopefully we can, we can get some interest behind this and uh, you all can go out and start trying it out for yourselves. Uh, I've broken it down into four different parts for the presentation. It's gonna be starting with data collection. Uh, I have a bunch of pictures that I took. It wasn't with my, uh, my camera phone or anything. It was a, an actual DSLR camera. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the pictures. I'll try and point some things out and in terms of what pictures might be good or bad. Uh, some of the issues that you're gonna run into. Uh, I'll take it into recap photo. And then after that, we will look at uh, recap Photo, which is now a desktop application. So all of this was developed out uh, at the beginning of the year. And fortunately for me, on December 1st, Autodesk made a change to all of how Recap and Remake works. Uh, so as of December 1st, Remake, which was the program I used to use, no longer exists. And it is now Recap Photo that you have access to through uh, Recap Pro. So if you have an AEC collection, if that's uh, what your subscription is under, you automatically have access to every application that I'm using here. And that was also one of the goals, it was to use uh, products that were already in a collection that you might have, so you don't have to buy anything new, um, and it's, it's all equipment and things that you can, you can get to on your own. Uh, it, it is a, a multi-step process, primarily because of the file formats. So one of the biggest things and biggest issues is file format and cross-product compatibility. So there are uh, three different steps that you're gonna go from to take a JPEG into a, an RCM file. It, it's technically the, the file format for recap photo. That's gonna turn into an FBX file. FBX files are 3D models that can go into AutoCAD. And unfortunately, FBX files are not directly compatible with Revit at the moment, but AutoCAD drawings are. So if you can get the FBX into AutoCAD and turn that into a 3D object inside of a DWG file, then your DWG file can go into Revit. And in the end, uh, you can add it as a part to a Revit family. It'll show up as an item in your model, works with scheduling and everything. So it, it's a way to go from pictures to something that'll show up on a schedule in Revit if you really needed to. Uh, I'll, I'll try and do all of this live, but as everybody knows, live presentations are always the smoothest in some cases, especially when you're working with large data sets and going across multiple programs and things. So I do have uh, every stage saved at a, at a certain point if I need to, but I'll, I'll try and do this as, as live as possible for the presentation. And uh, just to go over again, the, the products that I'm gonna be using are uh, three different pieces from the collection. Uh, the first is gonna be Recap Photo. So Recap Photo is now available through your Recap Pro subscription. Uh, it is a download, so you're gonna download and install it, shows up as an icon on the desktop, and it looks exactly like how a Remake used to look. So it is essentially just a renamed version of that, but it is now included as part of the Pro subscription. After that, it's just plain AutoCAD, standard AutoCAD, uh, not any AutoCAD architecture or anything like that. And then Revit um, is the end result where we're gonna have either family or you can even do it just as a link file if you want. And there are certain scenarios where families might be good or link files might be better. And I, I've got a couple of examples for you there as well. 
So recap photo to AutoCAD to Revit. That's our cross-product workflow for this one. So part one, uh, part one is data collection and processing. It all starts with collecting your data. And in this case, it's gonna be digital photographs. And when we talk about digital photographs, the quality of your photographs are much more critical than the quantity of photographs that you take. With, with the recap photo uh, processing, you have a minimum of 20 pictures that you need to post. So you can post 20 pictures at the minimum, 250 pictures at the maximum. I, I've seen excellent models come out of 20 to 30 pictures, and I've seen horrible models come out of 250 pictures. So it, it really is quality over quantity. Uh, in regards to data collection with the pictures, you wanna try and get as many different angles of your subject as possible. Uh, and just for the sake of the presentation, I'm using a fire hydrant for my example. Uh, not necessarily the most relevant thing to Revit, I know, but it was right outside of my house and it was really easy to take pictures of because it doesn't move. So stationary objects are, are always nice. Uh, I have seen people take pictures of themselves, so you could actually make a model of yourself and put it in a Revit if you want to. Uh, we had a, an Autodesk guy come in and he, took a picture of his face and he stuck it on one of the, the people so that anytime he makes a model, he, he can zoom into himself inside of his model. And, and it, it's just one of those things where you can apply it to so many different scenarios. Uh, so you, you really wanna try and get as many good quality pictures as possible. And these are uh, the pictures that I have. So for the fire hydrant itself, I ended up with about 80 pictures. I think it was 82 or 83 in total. And in a lot of cases, it's just walking around and taking pictures of all different angles and all different heights. Uh, ideally, you want to avoid dark, shadowy areas or very, very white areas because there's not a lot of differentiation in pixels there. When you think about pixel recognition, it has to be able to tell one pixel from the next. If it's a solid color or if you're taking something way too close where there's not context in the background, it's very difficult for stitching to occur correctly. So in this case, I was probably about two or three feet away uh, and I just went through all different sorts of angles. I, I did actually notice that an overcast condition outside was a lot better than bright conditions. I've, I've done bright pictures before and you end up with shadows inside of the model I actually have a shadow of me over a curb ramp because I had taken some pictures bright uh, middle of the day. This was an overcast day. It happened to be awesome because there was no shadowing or very, very little shadowing at all. Uh, and I ended up with just about 80 pictures. So if you happen to be driving around Shoreline on this day, you saw me standing on the side of the road taking pictures of a fire hydrant. And that was me. Uh, so anyway, uh, you, you get all of your photos. You take as many pictures. Uh, especially in smaller detail areas. So for this particular fire hydrant, there was a lot of detail on the connection for the fire hose and also on the, the rivets and the, the screws on the sides. So I tried to get a bunch of different angles around those objects as possible. There was even some wording on the back. So if you look at this, uh, there's some wording on the back that are, it's um, forged letters, I guess, that are just part of the, the cast when they created the fire hydrant. So as much detail as you need, you're gonna take all of the pictures that you can. Uh, and again, you wanna have a, a little bit of overlap in each picture just so that you can line one up with the next. And of course, try not to get too close because if I zoomed in all the way where it was just yellow, there would be no way to tell what yellow was here with yellow in the next picture. So you wanna have some type of background context. Now once you've got the pictures, uh, that's where you essentially take it to recap photo. Uh, if you do happen to have a scanner or you know someone that has a scanner, you can actually skip the whole picture taking process and output the point cloud directly. So you can get a point cloud out of a laser scanner and convert that to a mesh if you need to. Uh, recap Pro does have that convert to mesh capability, but it will only work with structured scan data, meaning your scans have to be tripod mounted with, you know, reference points to where the locations are and everything, so that it knows where to tie everything back into. But if you can get your hands on some scan data that has some structure behind it, uh, or structured information behind it, then you, you would be able to create this mesh as well. And ideally, the mesh is the end result that we're going for, because that's what we get uh, the FBX out of. Uh, if you are interested in more uh, information about structured scans and how that all works, I put a little condensed uh, 
link there for you to find uh, some, some data. So once we get the pictures, what do we do next? So this, this is where we get into our first Autodesk application, and that's going to be what's now called Recap Photo. So within Recap Photo itself, uh, this is the new interface that will appear. So it is a separate icon that gets installed. Uh, if you've got Recap Pro, when you launch that and look for a photo option, it's going to take you to a download where it'll install the, the executable file. Uh, now, directly in this interface, you have an option to create 3D models from either objects or aerials. Uh, we had a question earlier from David about uh, taking some pictures of his house. The aerial option would be where you're going for that one, as opposed to just stationary objects. Uh, once you've got this launched, it's just a matter of where you're getting your pictures from. So I would locate all of the pictures on my local drive, drag them and drop them into the application. It's going to load them all up. And then from there, it's creating a project. Now, this phase of the process does require some cloud credits. It is a web-based service, so cloud credits are required. Uh, you get cloud credits with your subscription, so you're just going to be using some of those. For this particular fire hydrant, if you take a look at that corner right there, it says 12 cloud credits are the estimated cost. Uh, so it would charge my account 12 cloud credits to produce this. And then once it's done, uh, I'm not going to do this because I've already done it, so I'm going to cancel this out. Once it's done, you're going to get an email. Uh, it'll show up in your cloud drive as uploading the photos and processing. And then once that whole process is complete, you will receive an email back from Recap Photo. It's going to say your fire hydrant is ready or whatever you call the name of the project. You'll be able to view it inside of Recap. So it'll show up down here at the bottom. This was the project as it was completed. And then you would download that item and open it up inside of the desktop application. And it is an RCM format. So we're taking it to RCM at this point. I'm, I'm actually not sure. It used to be five credits. So that when I did this earlier this year, it charged me five credits. Now it was 12 when I did it yesterday. So I'm not exactly sure how it charges me. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in the past, the cost was based on the level of quality that you requested. So there's an option to just do like a preliminary model if you wanted to check out what it's going to look like, and that was free. But if you wanted a model that you could then download in different for, uh, file formats, that was a charge for the cloud credits. Uh, if you don't have access to the Recap Photo desktop app, you can also go to recap.autodesk.com. It's a, a web-based uh, interface for the same service. Uh, it takes you to your Autodesk 360 login. Once you're logged in there, you can post the same type of projects and uh, very similar options in terms of how to create a project. And that one is all uh, web-based, so you'd be able to open it up in Google Chrome and view uh, your point cloud before you decide to download the model. Now, you can also supplement a lot of these. So if you post something and then you get a model back that seems to be missing some areas or some areas aren't quite as accurate as you would hope, um, you're allowed to repost more photographs. A lot of times, if your photographs have some issues in terms of shading or something like that, they might get disregarded from the stitching. Uh, so you could replace those with better photos and resubmit the project and then uh, go from there. I, I was told as long as the project name doesn't change, it, it's not going to charge you again for reposting the same thing. But if you're resubmitting it as an entirely new thing, then you may get charged credits again. So just kind of be aware of that. Always read, read the little notifications that pop up. I, I tend to just blast through them and click OK whenever I see something. So it, it could be charging me more credits than I think sometimes. But uh, for the most part, you're, you're going to be able to get an RCM file. Uh, RCMs are primarily the file format that I chose because of this application. So when I take it into uh, Recap Photo, which used to be Remake, I now have uh, the ability to modify, review, and edit the model. So this is the end result of all of those photographs. Uh, I was able to get this into Remake, and you can see that it does pick up all of the color. Uh, you can see all of the detail. If I zoom in far enough, you can see even the, the texture of the cast iron for the fire hydrant. You can read every word and see every letter. And it's got the 
a little bit of the cabling. So there was a, a metal cable that's connecting the cap there to the fire hydrant itself. And this is essentially what you're gonna end up with. But this is not necessarily what we wanna create a family part out of or uh, bring into Revit. So we need to do some cleanup. And this application does exactly that. So in the process of reviewing data, I'm also gonna be now selecting data and cropping some of the areas out. And you have to be a little careful with this in terms of how you're gonna do it because it's all line of sight editing. So even if I am only trying to select this, if I hit part of the fire hydrant in the process, because it's a 3D model, I may be deleting part of the hydrant. So you, you kind of have to get used to panning and zooming your way around. And then it's just a matter of selecting and, and uh, deleting areas. And I'm using the delete key. Um, you also have a little gizmo that tends to pop up if you're doing editing that would allow you to. So that's a right click and then you can get to delete the selected areas. So uh, it does take a little while to clean it up and you can see there I, I hit a little bit of the fire hydrant so that now I'd have to kind of go back and undo a couple of steps or, or clean that up more. Um, if you can get to a good side view perspective, there's a really good way to just crop out everything below. So if I have this thing mounted up, and that, that's actually something that I've been noticing recently. Um, if you're thinking about doing like an interior feature or some type of furniture in, instead of an outdoor item, uh, if you can kind of prop it up on top of something, then it's easier to clean out what's underneath it. Uh, this fire hydrant happened to have a riser underneath the bottom, so it was easy for me to just say, you know, at that level, I'm pretty much just chopping everything off underneath. And that's uh, made, uh, made the, the editing quite a bit easier to do. So now I've got you know, a lot cleaner of a model and this is what I would want to get my part from. So now I've got a fire hydrant, I've removed a lot of the data, uh, just kind of disregard that. I've already saved this out. So this is kind of the, the 50,000 level view of what you need to do. Uh, I would also want to make sure I clear out any type of uh, items that aren't really connected to the object. So this is where it gets a little bit more fine tuning. So you have to clean it up quite a bit. If you end up cutting off a piece, or in this case, you can see that it's entirely hollow. Uh, it doesn't have any idea what's inside of this thing or how thick it is. So you are really trying to get uh, a shell of the object. Now, once you get to this point, if you need to do some cleanup, if you notice that your, your model has some holes and things in it, you've got editing tools that allow you to fill holes. Um, you can do uh, slices as well for the entire bottom if I had not cropped out that part, I could fill the bottom and just kind of get that to, to work out by moving the different levels. So there's a, a little disc that you can move up and down that will cut or show more of the object and then that's where I would just create this fill to cap the bottom of it. So once you've got your model cleaned up and this is you know, just picks and clicks, it, it's one of those, the more time you can spend on it, the nicer it'll be. So it, it's really up to you how much detail you want. Uh, after that, you're gonna go to exporting. So this is the step to get it from recap photo into an FBX file. Uh, fortunately, the, the, there are some preset export options. Uh, you can go to some detailed options where you've got the opportunity to specify the filtering that you wanna apply. And this is kind of a critical step because of the size of the output file. So an FBX file, if I were to export this out directly as an FBX, it'll be 200 megabytes or so. Uh, because of the level of detail in all of the different surface components, it's gonna create a mesh of this object. So the, the finer detail you've got, the bigger your file's gonna be. Uh, I did a straight export of this thing. I think it was just under 200 megabytes. If you drop it down to something under 100, uh, I, I try to go under 100,000 faces. Faces are just the, the triangulated surface areas. Uh, under 100,000 faces, it'll be okay. Um, 10, my, 10 megabytes or less. With this one, if you drop it down to maybe 90% of filtering, uh, it came out to about 700 kilobytes, well, under a megabyte. Uh, but that's the FBX file, so there's still more data that gets applied to that when you take it in the AutoCAD. So you're gonna go through this export option to get an FBX. Your target output type is an FBX file. Uh, there are some quick export settings. So there's an AutoCAD FBX option that's preset. 
as an export item, and you have different options for low, medium, and high quality. High quality would essentially be exactly as it is. Medium quality would be slightly decimated in terms of the mesh. Low quality would be uh, more highly decimated. So you get that FBX file out, and it's a now a 3D mesh model that works inside of AutoCAD. So once you've got that FBX file, you're going to take it into AutoCAD for the next round of steps. And that's where you would then, uh, we've already done the cleanup and the decimate, export to FBX file. That's going to be through these settings. Sorry, I skipped a bunch of slides here. Uh, importing the FBX, creating the 3D mesh. So there is a step between FBX to get it to DWG, where essentially you're just importing it as a block into AutoCAD. And then once it's a block in AutoCAD, you're going to ex uh, explode that to get your mesh object that works with your Revit family. So we're importing the FBX as a block, converting it to a 3D mesh. At this point, if you want to apply a material, you are allowed to apply a material, but just be kind of aware that if you've got one solid object, you're only going to get one material. So if you're trying to get multi-materials, you'll have to make a bunch of different pieces and put them all together. So it's, uh, it's one of those where your material only gets applied to one object. So the fire hydrant's going to be all one thing. Uh, after that, you're going to attach it by layer. So the, the one step that we kind of made sure we had to do was there's an option to attach by layer with the materials in AutoCAD. And when you do that, it actually transfers over to Revit. So when, when you have it in Revit, you'll see the material, and it'll show up with the material in your family. So that's a critical step. If you just apply the material by dragging and dropping, uh, it'll show up in AutoCAD, but when you save it out and bring it into Revit, the material is not going to be assigned. So you do have to attach it to the layer in order for that data to go along with the object. So this is where we do converting the FBX to the DWG. Uh, and of course, again, we're just doing FBX import and then importing it as a block. So in this case, with an AutoCAD file, I just started out with a brand new blank AutoCAD file. Uh, the import options just right there in the application menu, import FBX. When you do the FBX import, you are selecting that output file that came from uh, recap photo. So there's a decimated mesh here with a low quality. So that was using as many of the options as I could to kind of simplify this thing down. Uh, and it ended up with 367 kilobytes, so less than half a megabyte. If you go with the full, like, high quality one, uh, I think that was this one up here, 56 megabytes. There's one, uh, let's see. Two megabytes, so that's not bad. And I've got one that's uh, like over 100 megabytes, I think. So I'm going to go with the, the low quality one just for the purpose of speed uh, in this case. Uh, when you do the S FBX import, there's, there's no real material that gets applied in your scan. So it's just one thing. So right now, we're, we're just focusing on the object. Uh, at this point, you have some scaling options as well. Or you can scale it in AutoCAD before you uh, save it as a DWG file. Uh, it's also a really good opportunity here to adjust the orientation if you prefer. Uh, when I was doing some research on this, uh, it, it, there was a note on one of the posts that says, anytime you import an FBX, it gets rotated along the x-axis by default, so it shows up sideways. Uh, and this happened with one of the other sample files we're working on as well. We had an elevator shaft uh, that when we imported it out, it, it turned out to be a tunnel sideways. So we had to adjust the uh, the UCS in AutoCAD. And that's all you really need to do. You're just resetting the UCS, so you're rotating it to view. UCS view, for anybody that doesn't know uh, too much about AutoCAD commands. And that resets the XYZ axis. Once you've got that in there, just save it and you're ready. So that import option was just as is. Uh, import FBX, choose the object, and then from there, you got the insert command. Once you use the insert command, you've got a 3D mesh of your model. Uh, I make sure to use the explode option to convert it from a block to that mesh in AutoCAD. And then you now have a 3D fire hydrant. So this is a fire hydrant that's now created from those photos, decimated down to about three, 300 kilobytes or so, and it's now inside of AutoCAD. Uh, if you've got it, uh, the materials browser open, you can apply some materials. Let's see if I can find something. You can make a gold fire hydrant if you want to. There's some gold in here, diamond plated. So you're really just kind of dragging and dropping it on there. And once it's applied, uh, when you go into a different type of uh, view, 
selection, then you'll be able to see the actual materials. So this is the different materials been applied to your fire hydrant, and this would now only appear in AutoCAD. So if you want that same material information to show up inside of, um, inside of Revit, then you're gonna have to go to your material mapping and actually attach that. So uh, there's an option inside of here where we are now going with material, if I can find it, remember where it was. Sorry, uh, I just did this yesterday and now I can't remember what it was. There, there is an actual just map materials and it's called assign it to layers. And it's gonna be uh, where you are essentially sticking the material information onto the layer that's associated with the object. Uh, if I can remember where that is, I'll, I'll take a screenshot of it. But um, it, it's uh, supposedly, or supposed to be in the ribbon, so. Imagine that I did that there, right click or click on the ribbon icon, you're gonna do attach the layer, and I have a screenshot of it in the PowerPoint actually, so just in case, oh, maybe not. Um, you're gonna do that attach, and then save it as a DWG. So once you're inside of AutoCAD, you now have a 3D mesh object that's got a material applied to it, and you're gonna do save as plain AutoCAD drawing, because that's the intent for where we're gonna go next where we've got an AutoCAD DWG file that we want to take into uh, Revit family. So the AutoCAD DWG file, in this case, with the sample set that I created, came out to be about two megabytes. So that filtered out and saved down decimated mesh, imported into AutoCAD, converted into a mesh object, assigned to a material, would then be uh, in one case, seven megabytes, and then in another case, two megabytes. So depending on the level of detail that you go with, uh, your file size is, is relatively manageable. Uh, here's the high detail. So everything that came out of Recap Photo in terms of the fire hydrant, not decimated, taken straight into AutoCAD, applied with the material, 171 megabytes. Uh, it's probably not something that you want to import into Revit as part of your, your Revit families. So uh, that's where you kind of want to make sure that you're doing those filtering to get it simplified down. So once you are in uh, the scenario where you've now got your AutoCAD DWG file, then we're gonna go into Revit, and inside of Revit, you've got a couple of different options. So with the, with the Revit functionality com uh, compatible with uh, AutoCAD DWG files, you've got the first option of adding it to a family where you're gonna open your, your Revit family, import your CAD object, and then you're, you're gonna basically save and define it there and then load it into your project. From, from that point on, it'll be an item that you can select and choose. Uh, this option number one, where you're applying it to family, also works with scheduling. So because it's now part of a defined part in a family, you can get it to show up in a schedule. Uh, if you've got a second scenario where you just wanna take it straight into Revit, not adding it as part of a family, you can do a straight import or straight link of CAD file in Revit and in most cases, that option would be used for a structural component or something really big, uh, where you've got a, like a one-of scenario, like a house or an elevator shaft or a car. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to put in a car as part of family, but uh, it, it's one of those, like, if you've got a big thing that's only going to show up once in your drawing, then you just do the straight import or link CAD. If you've got something that you might use in multiple scenarios, uh, instead of a fire, you could do a model of the podium if you wanted to get podiums or chairs, and if you want to get chairs, then you would do option number one. So site components, objects used multiple times. Uh, if you wanted to show up in a schedule, then you definitely want to add it to the family. Otherwise, you can go with a straight link CAD. Uh, so let's take a look at that process here. So in this case, I, I did actually just start out with uh, one of the sample Revit files, but if you wanted to uh, go with like just opening up a project, uh, if you've got an ongoing project, you can start just from the file that you're in, or you can start and do this ahead of time and then load it into your project afterwards. But this is just the, uh, you're all probably familiar with this one, it's the sample project that comes with Revit out of the box. Uh, so from here, we're gonna go with creating a new family. 
And for the fire hydrant, we went with uh, the site option because it's one of the site components that would be laying on the ground. So uh, from what I learned in the process of doing this, uh, different families have different uh, restrictions and things or different uh, criteria that's applied. So depending on what you're trying to do or what type of piece you're trying to uh, add it to, then you would select the, the most appropriate thing there. So in this case, from the uh, site family, we're gonna go on and insert a CAD file, so we're importing CAD. And going straight to the output DWG that was saved in, in AutoCAD. So this is the one that was saved with that uh, gold material. And this is usually where you've got a little bit of adjusting to do as well. So you're, you're setting the orientation, you're setting the insert point, you're just gonna move stuff around uh, and save it as is. And this is where you can scale it as well. So it happened to be pretty well on center. Uh, sometimes they'll come in pinned, so you just make sure you unpin it first. And then from the rotation, Just kind of line it up and then move it in spot. So it's now on, on center in terms of where I want it to be placed or how I want to control it to be placed. Uh, and then, of course, you can also go to one of the elevation views or side views, I should say, and place it relative to vertical uh, placement. So in this one, if we're looking at the reference level zero, then if I kept it as is, it would be floating in the air a little bit, right? So. Uh, at this point now, we're just kind of moving it down and dropping it into the on-site level. So we, we define the insertion point relative to the object and also the reference elevation relative to the level that you're going to be referring to. So then it's a save. And loading it back into the project. So once it's loaded into the project, you should be able to get to it um, essentially from your project browser and inside of whatever view you're placing it on. So if I go to like the site view, uh, we would be able to then find that whole um, Sorry, this is where my Revit skills are on full display. So once you've got the object uh, placed in there, it would show up. Uh, I'm just going to go with the one that I placed in here already. So there's a fire hydrant now that's inside of my Revit model. It shows up as a piece that I can control. Uh, it's part of the family that I defined. It'll show up in a schedule that I create. Uh, when I was researching this, I, I tried to look up as much of the issues that I could in terms of what might happen. There were some posts where uh, they were trying to get some stuff in that weren't showing up on sections. So if you go with a straight point cloud, which is an, uh, it's always an option, you can scan something and take a point cloud directly in the Revit file, you'd be able to visually see the object there, but point clouds are non-solids. They're just a bunch of points that are in the drawing. So they don't really show up in terms of detail on rendering or any type of uh, sections or solids and things. So you can always, uh, put in this solid object now, and whenever you go to a section, you would then be able to see the object in a section based on the reference elevation and the point that we selected. It's going to be attached to the right level there. So at this point, you now have a component that's part of your Rev family that you loaded into your project, and you can use it as much as you want. And this is applicable to essentially anything you can take pictures of. Uh, it's it's really what you can apply it to in your head. You can probably get it done inside of Revit. So at this uh, stage in this, the, the workflow, it's just a matter of getting all of your pictures done, building all of the parts that you want to build, and then making sure you have enough cloud credits to process everything, I guess, in, in terms of the recap photo. Um, the other project that I had up earlier, or that I had on the, the main page, was the Um, the elevator shaft. So let me uh, open up the elevator shaft. 
The elevator shaft came from uh, Modulus, which is our partner that does some uh, custom services. And in this particular case, uh, they had received a scan for an elevator shaft that was part of the project they were working on, and they were trying to get it into Revit for uh, model-based content. So they needed something that was a solid that they could actually see and use inside of Revit. So this happened to me yesterday as well. Uh, it'll be spinning for a while, perhaps. But uh, this is the option number two scenario, where rather than going through the process of trying to convert it to an FBX file, or you actually still need to convert it to an FBX, but instead of uh, creating a block out of it and bringing it into a Revit family, you're just going to go straight into Revit and do a, a link CAD or an insert CAD file. And that would essentially then become part of your Revit model. So this is now a, a solid object that's appearing from that linked CAD file. Um, I ended up going with a much more highly decimated mesh just for the purpose of speed. Uh, if you leave this one at full detail, then it, it's quite a large file. and it, it takes a long time to process. So there are uh, some scenarios that I encountered where it's just a matter of waiting it out. Uh, as long as you can keep monitoring it for a while, you'll be able to uh, kind of keep track and make sure it's moving a little bit. But this was a mesh scan that, or a point cloud scan that came out of a scanner and then turned into a drawing. And the drawing, the AutoCAD drawing itself is uh, this one here. So when we look at it in AutoCAD, you can see at full detail, there's quite a bit of, of information that you can get out of it. You can even see the insides. So it was an inside and outside scan. Uh, and it, there are uh, a lot of detailed components to this. Um, the project that they're working on ended up using this as is, so they have a really, really big uh, file to work with, but it showed them the exact size and they could place it directly inside of the building to work with any type of conflicts or any type of um, clashes that might be encountered when they're doing renovations. So it's a good way to get uh, as-built conditions into your model as well if you're not able to get uh, drawings that you could model from or an existing model that you could take. Uh, this particular file is pretty large, so that was uh, the dome elevator. 30 megabytes in, in terms of uh, the AutoCAD file itself. And then when it's taken into Revit, it's, it becomes part of that linked file. Uh, and you can see inside of this one as well, it was decimated, but there's still some content inside of there that you can get to. Uh, and again, the higher detail you've got is just a longer wait in the end. But uh, I would try and make sure you always double check what's going on when you do the decimation. I, I did say that's kind of a critical step in terms of getting a file that's manageable, but you don't want to uh, decimate it to the point where you're losing detail. Yeah, so uh, anytime you have an object that's a large scale or something that you need to get a more precise type of measurement or scale from, uh, it's, it's always a good idea to, to include what we call targets inside of your photographs. And targets can just be uh, print out on a piece of paper. Uh, I've seen people draw bullseyes. I've seen people use uh, just like a, a benchmark symbol that's out there with the, the little circle that's got the crosshatch in the middle. and. <clears throat> you're adding this to the data inside of your photo. So it becomes visual reference information uh, that gets added to the model that you can analyze in the end. Uh, so a lot of this process, when you go through just the recap photo uh, interface itself, so if I were to submit a project here, uh, there isn't really anything you need to do. It's just gonna be an item that would then appear inside of the mesh once it gets downloaded. Uh, that whole process actually is more applicable to uh, the full Recap Pro version. So Recap Photo is just where you convert the pictures to the model. Uh, and that, to get the, uh, the targets and things in there, you're just going to make sure that they're included inside of your pictures. 
And you may want to you know, number the targets or come up with uh, somewhat of a way to distinguish which ones are which. Uh, I would also recommend placing them at a known distance so you not only have a visual target for um, reference, but you also have a, a target for scaling. So I, I can measure between two targets that I've set at you know, 10 feet apart or whatever it is. And If, if your subject doesn't have a lot of detail, then the target will help uh, because it's giving it just some differentiation between pictures. Uh, but if it's uh, something like a house, then you're really just looking for visual reference in terms of scaling uh, and, and placement of the, the pictures. Uh, you can go through and stitch some things together, but that's going to be more scan related than, than photo related. So you, you would need to have uh, that information available to you. In this case, this is a scan, uh, laser scan that was done of a site. This one was part of Recap. So when you import or install Recap, I'm pretty sure this is going to be there. But this one has a target. So this is that uh, crosshatch pattern that I was talking about earlier, where it's, it's pretty much just a, a piece of paper that you're printing a cross on, or a, this one's an X with some color-coded squares and then some reference information. So these would be placed at locations around the site that you are aware of. So you, you are setting these up. And then when you have the model itself, you can go back and uh, measure distances to cross-check the distances and also adjust your model to do some scaling if you need to do some scaling there. So it's all available within the, the Recap Pro software. Um, if you've got scanners, so I, I know that this was intended primarily for what you can do with uh, digital photographs, but if you do have scanners, uh, scanners can also import uh, survey points. So if, if you can pick up a survey point, if you've got a control point or a marker somewhere out there that you've got an actual geographic location on, you can collect that data in terms of an XYZ value. And then when you process the scan uh, inside of Recap Photo, photo you can assign uh, that known coordinate to a marker point. So that would be another situation where you want to apply some type of visual marker to the ground. Uh, that would then geolocate your entire project. So if you're taking it somewhere else, you're now in a known coordinate system with an, with an actual reference to elevations and everything. Uh, so the, the markers are uh, primarily for your, your own reference in terms of fine tuning the model. Uh, and then if, if it's a, a detail thing where you're just trying to put some additional differentiation, then uh, that's also gonna help. But size of the markers would depend on the, the subject as well. Um, I did notice that if, I was taking pictures of some furniture. I tried a, a chair and a bench. Uh, if the chair was glossed, so if it was a high gloss finish, that did not work well at all. So shiny objects are very, very difficult to stitch together. Uh, it, it was a nice wavy bench when it turned out, but it wasn't supposed to necessarily be that well, uh, that way. So you're gonna run into that type of scenarios also in, in some cases. Uh, so for what you're bringing into Recap Pro, uh, Recap Pro is going to process the point cloud. So from Recap Photo's web service, uh, there is an RCS format file. It's a Recap scan file, uh, and that's what's going to be in here. If you get to the point where you're looking for a mesh, then that's going to be RCM. So the two kind of primary file formats that work with Recap are RCS and RCMs. Uh, Recap uh, Photo, the one where we uh, the one where I had uh, cropped out some of the areas and then exported the FBX file, that was the RCM. And then uh, for this one, this is point cloud data. You can still crop and edit a lot of this information out, but for this particular case, the mesh option is where it'll only work with the structured scan information. So this has to come from a uh, laser scanner. This, this one won't work with photo-based RCS files. Uh, if you've got a bunch of RCSs that you need to stitch together, there's a way to add multiple files, and then it saves them all under RCP. It's a recap project file that uh, kind of interlocks or in, uh, interconnects all of the different scan files that you've got. Uh, 
Yes, uh, RCP is just like an indexing file, so it doesn't actually save a lot of data, but it'll uh, save if you've got four scans that you need to stick them together. Uh, the You can save it as RC, uh, RCP, yeah. Uh, Navis works and everything should work with RCSs as well because they're somewhat of the same file for it. Nope, okay, yeah, uh, RCP is fine. So when you do a save or a save as, RCP is the option. So it, it's gonna index it for you in terms of what you've got. And in this case, it's just one scan, so it's gonna save that one scan as part of the, the project itself. Yeah, um, if I can get to the online version of this. Hopefully this is not recording keystrokes also, because then, did you, did you guys hear about that? People have been making videos and things and posting it to like YouTube and screencast and it's screencast saves keystrokes, right? So they're like logging in the A360 and then you see the guy's password and everything pop up on the screen. So you'd be very careful with that when you're recording. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, and it, it tends to vary. At one point, I think I had like two million cloud, cloud credits, but now, now it's different. So this is, this is the old interface uh, where you were all online. So this is now that Recap Photo desktop application that you can download. So when I click on this, it'll say this is now available through Recap Photo. But if you prefer the online version, then it'll take you through these step-by-step -step options. And I, I like the little step number three here where it says grab a coffee because that's always the like, now you've got to wait. So th that's where you're essentially waiting for the email to come back. Um, if, if I were to try and submit this or try uh, submit this through the same process, I'll just do a, a handful of pictures here. So minimum 20, maximum 250. If you're under 20, it's gonna say you, you need a minimum of 20, so I add more photos. So that's just the same uh, type of steps where you're uploading it. This one is cheaper. So this one says five cloud credits uh, to get to what I want. You want to choose the ultra option in this case if you are going with uh, an output type that you want to download. So the, the preview option will stitch together all of your photographs and you'd be able to see the end result without having to pay anything. Uh, so it's kind of a way to review the quality of your pictures before you end up posting it there. Uh, if you're ready to go with what you want, uh, then you're going to go with the basically five cloud credit option. And then you would be able to choose your different file formats as well. So RCS is the one that will go into uh, Recap Pro. RCM, it still says Autodesk Momento which is the beta name, I think it was, of the product that turned into Remake. I think it was at 1.123D Catch or something like that. And now it's Recap Photo. So that's, just remember RCM, RCS. Those, those are the two file types that you want. Once you get to that point, you're gonna go up, create, it's gonna upload all the information, and then you're waiting for that email to come back. So it's the same process, but in a slightly different interface to go through this Recap site than to go through um, the, the desktop recap photo app. Uh, I've tried a bunch of different things. The only two that are currently showing up on uh, my dashboard are the fire hydrants that I took uh, a couple of different uh, projects for, but I've done curb ramps. Um, we've done the bench that I mentioned before. Uh, I've got a model of Brian's head somewhere. He's sitting on his chair and his desk and it's like spun him around and took some pictures. Uh, with that one, the, the back of his head is empty, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it, it really does come down to the quality. His hair is also very shiny, if you notice. So that, that part of it didn't quite work out well in the stitching. But yeah, you, I mean, you can take pictures of anything. Uh, the, the only issue that I've ever run to where I've gotten a blank modeled back is if you're trying to do something that's copyrighted information. So if you're taking pictures of something that is uh, not technically something you should be modeling, then it, it'll just filter it out from, 
from the thing. So I tried to do like an action figure, and when I posted the action figure, all I got back was my table. They, they took the whole thing out. So yeah. it's something to be aware of as well. If you if you get entirely blank things back, it's because of the data content, copyright information in most cases. So um, that being said, it's about 12:50, and we're winding down to the end of this thing. So. Uh, the last step here, again, you're just taking things from file format to file format. So if, you, if you're thinking about the big picture, it's like translating different words from different languages. And you've got a bunch of different people who can speak certain languages, but they don't all speak the same language. So you're going from JPEGs to RCMs to FBXs to DWGs to Revit. And that's all they get from uh, your megapixels in your picture to your model in Revit. And uh, everything is within the AEC collection. So if you've got your hands on an AEC collection subscription, you're ready to go uh, and ready to test. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>